Hi. Today we're going to look at property rights, particularly property rights in land, which are especially important in developing economies. And we're going to examine a very basic shift through historical examples, the shift from collective ownership to something closer to or towards private ownership. Let's begin with the basics. Jeremy Bentham summed up the case for property rights when he said, he who has no hope that he shall reap will not take the trouble to sow. What property rights do is they connect actions with consequences. They connect initiative with reward and indolence with privation or poverty. When those that sow reap the benefits, there's a greater incentive to work and to invest. In addition, property rights also make it easier to trade rights, to reallocate rights to those who can use them to best advantage. And they may increase the ability to access credit when you can use property as collateral. Today we're going to be focusing on the incentive that property rights create to work and to invest. In 1949, the communists under Mao abolished private property in China. And in the Great Leap Forward, farmers were put to work on collective farms of up to 5,000 families. So in essence, what this meant is that a farmer who put in an extra day of work and who, say, produced an extra bushel of wheat, wheat he would receive one five thousandths of that bushel. Thus, collective rights severed the connection between actions and consequences. They severed the connection between work and reward. And due to this and a host of other mistakes on the part of the Chinese leadership, there was mass starvation. As many as 18 to 30 million people may have starved in China in the worst possible horrible circumstances. Collective land ownership in China wasn't ended by a decree from the top. It was ended by a spontaneous revolt, really, from below. In 1978, farmers from 18 households in Zhaogang village risked their lives to secretly end land communism. The villagers divided the collective land by household. Each household agreed to deliver a quota to the government, but they all agreed that they would keep whatever remained. This is their secret agreement which was signed with a thumbprint. A clause in the agreement reads, if any word about this is divulged and one of us is put in prison, other team members shall share the responsibility to bring up his child till he or she is 18. It was a remarkable agreement. And it was with this agreement that China's second revolution really began. Under the household responsibility system of Zhaogang village, output increased by a factor of six. Now, at first, the communist bureaucracy tried to shut the system down, but it word got out. It began spreading to other villages. And as the bureaucracy saw that it's the success of the system, you know, Mao was dead. And so the new leadership decided that they would let the experiment continue. And in fact, by 1982, the household responsibility system became the official system. And thus, China's second revolution had begun. Today, in fact, there's a sculpture in Zhaogang Memorial Hall, which commemorates the secret beginning of China's rural reform. In China, this is actually quite a famous story. And the Chinese mark, this is the beginnings of sort of modern China, opening to the world, opening up of trade, increasing agricultural productivity, allowing people to move to the cities, increasing exports. It all began with Zhaogang Village. Surprisingly, another example of the problem of land communism comes from the early history of the United States. When the Pilgrims first landed at Plymouth, they set up a system of land collectivization. This didn't work very well, and soon they began to starve. So Governor William Bradford described what happened next. At length, after much debate of things, the governor assigned to every family a parcel of land. In other words, the governor ended land collectivization and set up a household responsibility system, just like in Zhaogang village, he goes on. This had very good success, for it made all hands very industrious. The women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set corn, where before they would allege weakness and inability, and whom to have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression. So as early as 1623, William Bradford realizes that to even try to get land communism 
to work is going to require tyranny and oppression. Moreover, he goes on, this was terrible for morality because it made everyone suspicious of one another. When someone was sick, for example, people began to wonder, is that person really sick or are they just trying to be lazy? Are they trying to take advantage of other people? It led to resentment and distrust. So William Bradford says, far from collectivism creating benevolence, this collective system actually created suspicion, distrust, and resentment. It's a fabulous section of On Plymouth Plantation. I'll give you a reference at the end of the lecture. Here's another modern example, Vietnam. Under the French, most land in Vietnam was owned by a handful of plantation owners, mostly French, some Vietnamese. After independence in 1954, land in the north was initially distributed to the farmers. And that had actually good properties. But the communists quickly reversed these policies and collectivized the land. By the mid-1960s, most peasant farmers were working on collectives. As in China, collectivization reduced agricultural productivity. Per capita, rice production dropped from 269 kilograms in 1961 to just 194 kilograms in 1975. One farmer really summed up what had happened with the new system. Under collectivization, there was no responsibility and there was no rice. After unification of North and South Vietnam, after the Vietnam War, there were further attempts at collectivization in the South. A lot of peasant resistance, not very successful. The system was also not working in the North. And by 1988, millions of Vietnamese were severely hungry and in famine, especially in the North. With the country on the verge of mass starvation, the government reversed course and introduced the doi moi or renovation policies. On April 5, 1988, Resolution 10 abolish the requirement that performers that farmers perform collective labor. It allocated land to households and gave them a 15-year tenure. So not pure private property rights, but a much greater security of property. Output markets were privatized and investment decisions decentralized. These policies increased output dramatically, and Vietnam became a significant exporter of rice for the first time in a very long time. Under these policies, land, however, could still not be transferred or sold. In 1993, private property was pushed even further when reforms granted the rights to transfer, exchange, inherit, rent, and mortgage property. So this required a significant effort to survey, to register, and to title property. With these stronger rights, which took time to implement throughout the country, farmers began to switch to crops requiring greater investment, but bearing higher returns. So fruit trees, for example, they began to invest more in fruit trees, which don't pay off unless you have future rights. There was also greater investment in irrigation. No significant changes in access to credit, however. So what we see here with examples spanning many different times and many different places is that land collectivization has often failed. In fact, it's often led to mass starvation and hatred and resentment. Now, sometimes privatization is not possible. Sometimes the commons may be the best that we can do, and there are better and worse ways of managing the commons. We'll talk about that another time. We'll also talk in more detail about how private property is instituted on the ground, about different types of surveying systems, registration systems, titling systems, identification systems. For more uh, further readings on the t stories we've talked about in this lecture, you can see the references here. Thanks.